Alcatraz Penitentiary, The Rock. There is no American prison more infamous and no group of inmates more notorious. When a murderous crime wave swept across the nation, this prison was opened to house the most incorrigible, fearsome names like Al Capone and Machine Gun Kelly. The plan was to put all the bad apples in one basket and nail the lid shut. Remove these hardcore and high-profile convicts from the rest of the prison system, throw them in one escape-proof pen, then crush their will and break their spirit. Physical brutality was not the rule here. Mental brutality was the rule here. Uh, and that's what it was meant to do, was to break you mentally. This wasn't a prison of rehabilitation. This was a prison of punishment, strictly punishment. We weren't sent here for our crimes that we committed out in that free world. Technically, we were sent here for crimes that we committed in other penitentiaries. Guys they could not break. Strong-willed men, that's what came to Alcatraz. The problem was that the prison itself and the way it was run with punishment in mind made guys psychotic. So you lose the ability to sit down and reason things out. You had to do whatever you have to do to survive. If that means you and I have a beef, then I'm out to hurt you as bad as I can hurt you so I don't have to do it again. When I come to this prison, you yourself could be the biggest notorious killer there ever was, but I could care less. You know why? I can kill you just as easy as you can kill me. That was my attitude. You didn't intimidate nobody on this island. Uh, if a man threatened me that he was going to do me in, well, I ain't going to give him that chance. I'm going to nail him. One way or another, I'm going to put that man down. So you watch what you said here. For 29 years, Alcatraz reigned as America's Devil's Island. But the story of this prison begins long before it became a federal penitentiary. When Spanish explorers first entered San Francisco Bay in the 1700s, they charted a barren island inhabited only by thousands of pelicans. They named it Isla de los Alcatraces, Island of Pelicans. Early settlers of the city paid little attention to the island that was best known for its deep covering of bird droppings. They nicknamed it Guano Island. However, the U.S. Army recognized Alcatraz as an excellent location for protecting the harbor of San Francisco. In 1853, they began the daunting task of building a fort and a lighthouse on the desolate island. Fortified gun emplacements were constructed for cannon that weighed up to seven and a half tons. A 20-foot high defensive wall stretched more than 500 feet. The entire rounded top of the island was leveled to a plateau to accommodate the barracks building known as the Citadel. Finally, by the end of 1859, the post on Alcatraz Island was opened. Alcatraz was cutting-edge technology for Army fortresses during the 1860s. At its height, when the Civil War ended, Alcatraz had 129 cannon mounted on it, which is uh, more than Fort Sumter and Fort Pulaski, the famous East Coast uh, battlefield forts combined. It mounted five guns that could fire 15-inch diameter cannonballs weighing 440 pounds, ranges up to three miles. Like all forts, Alcatraz had its guardhouse for soldiers who broke the law. But early on, the army realized the jail could be expanded to become an escape-proof prison for the military's hardcore offenders. In 1861, Alcatraz was designated the main army prison west of the Mississippi. Over the years, it held up to 600 inmates. As the prison population grew, a wooden cell house was constructed with cells no bigger than closets. 
By the early 1900s, the fort had become obsolete as a defensive position, but the prison thrived. In 1907, Fort Alcatraz was officially closed, but a new state-of-the-art prison facility was constructed, a building that eventually would evolve into Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. The cell house was the largest steel-reinforced concrete structure in the world, containing three three-tiered cell blocks. It was designed to hold 600 prisoners, one man per cell. Each cell was equipped with running water, a toilet, and forced air ventilation. A cast iron spiral staircase gave access to the upper tiers. Beneath the new prison remained the hallways from the original Citadel building. Punishment cells were created in this grim setting, where men were chained to the floor in complete darkness, offered only bread and water. After 14 days in solitary, the broken men would emerge, thankful to return to their cells. Through the 1920s, the inmate population at the military prison averaged about 400 men. But once the depression hit, it was deemed too costly for the army to maintain. However, Alcatraz would fit perfectly into the plans of the new Federal Bureau of Prisons. In the early 1930s, the nation was beset with hoodlums and organized crime figures, uh, the Al Capones and the Machine Gun Kellys, bank robbers and kidnappers and bootleggers and gangsters and gamblers and what have you that uh, were, were uh, very high profile. They were dominating the headlines. And the federal government had to do something about it, uh, something equally high profile to show that uh, there was a response to this wave of crime. And one of the responses was to establish a prison that would define hard time. The head of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Sanford Bates, along with his assistant and successor, James Bennett, hoped that by separating the notorious criminals, the troublemakers and the escape risks, the entire prison system would operate more smoothly. In 1933, the Justice Department took control of the military prison. Extensive renovations were launched to make Alcatraz even more secure. The flat, soft steel cell bars were replaced with tool-proof steel. Gun galleries with steel bars were built at the ends of the cell house so armed guards could keep watch. Metal detectors were installed, and outside, six guard towers were erected. Chain-link fence was added, and barbed wire was strung. In all, 336 cells were refurbished, and on July 1st, 1934, Alcatraz was declared open. The first inmates were 32 of the most incorrigible prisoners from the military prison. On August 11th, 1934, 14 inmates were transferred in from McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary. A week later, a special prison train left Atlanta Federal Penitentiary with 53 hardcore felons, including Al Capone. For absolute security, when the train arrived in San Francisco, the entire car was shipped to the island by barge. Finally, the last mass shipment came from Leavenworth with 102 men, including Machine Gun Kelly. The bold experiment had begun. The question now was, could Alcatraz impose its will on 200 of the nation's toughest criminals? This is Broadway, the central corridor in the Alcatraz cell house. It is flanked by the two main cell blocks, B and C, each three tiers high with five by nine foot cells. A block was never refurbished after the army left and was rarely used by the federal penitentiary. D block became the area for isolation cells and solitary confinement. 
Warden James Johnston implemented the strict policies set forth by the Bureau of Prisons. And just as they hoped, word of the harsh conditions at this new penitentiary reverberated through the prison system. Of course, you hear a lot of rumors about Alcatraz because I was in another federal penitentiary. I was up at McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary. And uh, they threatened me for approximately 10 years, gonna send me to Alcatraz. But uh, back in them days, I didn't care about nothing. You couldn't threaten me with nothing. I told them what they could do with their Alcatraz. Leon Whitey Thompson was serving 15 years for bank robbery. He was shipped to Alcatraz in 1958. I got worked over pretty good at McNeil Island by a couple of guards. From then on, all I live for now is I'm gonna put one or both of them guards in a grave. And I didn't care at the time if I hit the grave with them, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get me a guard, a couple of guards, and that's what got me sent to Alcatraz. Jim Quillen was serving 45 years for kidnapping. He was transferred to Alcatraz in 1942 and spent 10 years on the rock. I was sent here because I was 22 years old. I was a high escape risk. I had escaped from every place I'd ever been. And I was very bitter and angry and very combative. So um, they weren't gonna keep me in an institution where rehabilitation was the main factor uh, because I wasn't ready for it. At Alcatraz, the dehumanizing process began immediately. They do some things that try to humiliate you. And they brought us into where the visiting room was. And they stripped off the prison clothes that I wore from McNeil Island. They stripped them off and they, uh, they uh, give you the finger wave. You know what the finger wave is. And uh, they go through all the cavities of your body. It's more or less to degrade you because uh, we didn't come in contact with nobody on our trip from McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary to Alcatraz. He had four rights. You had food, clothing, shelter, and medical care. Those were rights. Aside from that, anything else was a privilege. Work was a privilege. Um, mail was a privilege. Visits were a privilege. Everything was a privilege. Uh, they wouldn't force you to work. But if you didn't work, you spent 23 out of 24 hours in the cell. If you worked, you were out of a cell for seven hours, which is a big gap in your day. And it lets you develop some camaraderie with other guys, although they were never close because you never trusted anybody. There were no newspapers, magazines, or radios allowed. Privileges also included books from the library and movies twice a month. Recreation was permitted for just a few hours on the weekends. If an inmate broke the rules, he lost privileges. For serious infractions, he was sent to the isolation area where he would remain in his cell 24 hours a day. For more severe violations, he was sent to solitary confinement. Until 1939, Warden Johnston used the dungeons of the military prison for solitary, but eventually six special cells were constructed on D-block, and these became known as the Hole. Every time I went to the Hole, I went for 19 consecutive days. You never brushed your teeth, you never had a bath, you never changed your clothes. Now, the Bureau of Prisons policy theoretically was that there would be light in there. Uh, that's a fallacy. There was no light. It was total blackness. The mess hall was considered a potential trouble spot, so meals were restricted to 20 minutes, limiting the possibility of inmate unrest or violence. The dining hall, like any other part of Alcatraz, was quite strict. They would be marched in, uh, double-filed, down to the uh, steam table, pick up the food, 
everything they took on the plate they had to eat. If they did not eat everything on the plate, they did not eat the next meal. It was very strict. The eating utensils were kept there on the table. Uh, if I was assigned to the dining room, I'd watch maybe two or three tables at one time, and I'd make sure as they filed out that all their utensils were there in my sight. If I couldn't see all those utensils, we would stop that line and we would search all the inmates. The mess hall was also equipped with tear gas canisters dotted along the ceiling. We used to call uh, the chow hall, we used to call that the gas chamber. And uh, once in a while something would come down and their orders were to press the button and release the tear gas in there. But they never did release the tear gas. The reason why is if they ever pressed that button and released that tear gas on us, them guards that are in that chow hall, they were dead. They were dead. They knew that them guards, if they ever pressed that button, them guards would be killed in a minute. Originally, talking was not allowed at Alcatraz, but that rule was unenforceable and eventually scrapped. Over the years, inmates developed their own secret system of communicating with one another. You and I are rapping, and uh, there's a guard coming down the tier, and uh, we're talking, and I say to you, cool the phrase, the is on a lope. You know what I said? Cool the phrase, in other words, shut up the talk. The Feeney Fong, the hack, the guard is on the lope, he's coming down the walk. The guards never knew what the hell we were talking about, but we had to, this little language between ourselves. Monotony and boredom were synonymous with life on the rock, and most former inmates agree it was more difficult to deal with than the physical conditions of Alcatraz. Another aspect of the psychological torment was the beautiful view of the city of San Francisco and freedom. Well, the very proximity of San Francisco to the island really played havoc with you mentally. You could see a whole panoramic view when you went to the yard. Uh, if you lived in certain areas, you could look out and see the lights at night. If the wind was from the right direction, um, you could hear the girls on the dock. You could hear the music from Aquatic Park. Um, you could smell the chocolate from the chocolate factory. and. Uh, they all, play, they all tend to uh, drive you over the edge. And I made it a policy never to have a cell that looked out. Uh, and I never used to look at the city. I never sit on the steps and look out at the city uh, because I knew I couldn't handle it. Inmates on Alcatraz reacted differently to the harsh conditions. Some accepted it, others rebelled. Some were driven insane, while others became obsessed with escape. When an inmate was sent to the rock, there was no possibility of parole. If he demonstrated that he was truly a changed man, he could be transferred back to another prison to possibly earn a parole there. This policy, along with the harsh life on the rock, led many inmates to dream of breaking out. But everyone knew the reputation of this prison. Alcatraz was escape-proof. Any man that attempted escape from Alcatraz is a man that's committing suicide. This is a man that's given up. This is a man that feels he has no future. He's gonna wind up dying in prison, so why not take a shot at it? Security was tight. The ratio of guards to inmates was much higher than in other prisons, about one officer for every three prisoners. The inmates were officially counted 12 times a day, but each guard was expected to do his own counts every 15 minutes. If an inmate managed to make it to the water, the swim to freedom was only about a mile. However, deadly currents and 50-degree water made the swim extremely difficult. Trained swimmers have often accomplished the feat, but for most prisoners, it appeared virtually impossible. 
During the 29 years of operation, a total of 14 escape attempts were made, involving 36 inmates. Nearly a third of them either died trying or were later executed in the gas chamber. Joe Bowers made the first escape attempt on April 27, 1936. The first escape attempt probably was a suicide, more than an escape attempt. Joe Bowers, who was regarded by a lot of prisoners as being a little bit crazy, uh, tried to climb a fence in full view of a tower guard, who of course shouted out some warnings. Bowers kept climbing the fence. They shouted out again and they warned him and he kept climbing the fence and they had no choice but to shoot at him. And they shot him and he dropped down the other side. Jim Quillen was another inmate determined to escape. My first seven and a half years here were concentrating on escaping. This was my home, I swam in the bay, the water didn't frighten me. I was a good, strong swimmer, I was only 25 years old. I really thought that I could beat the water and I still to this day believe I could have. Quillen tried to break out through a steam tunnel in the kitchen basement. It was three by three. It was so small that you couldn't turn around in it. All the hot steam pipes from the powerhouse come up through there and the temperature ranged anywhere from 145 to 165 degrees. But we thought that we could go from here to the powerhouse and then to the water. We'd been outsmarted and they'd poured a five foot piece of concrete between here and the powerhouse. Quillen was caught and sent to the hole for 19 days and then de blocked for a year. The bloodiest escape attempt made headlines in May of 1946 when six inmates took nine officers hostage in the main cell house. The violent episode led to the death of seven men and became known as the Battle of Alcatraz. The leader of the ill-fated attempt was Bernard Coy, a Kentucky bank robber obsessed with escape. He believed there was a weakness in the bars in the gun gallery where an armed guard stood watch over the cell house. Coy designed and built a bar-spreading device that he hoped would gain him access to the guard's arsenal. He worked as an orderly in the cell house and carefully monitored the daily activities of the guards. A key to Coy's plan was the movement of officer Ernest Lagesson. My father was the officer in charge of the cell house and Coy had determined that the time for this break would be when my father went to lunch um, because at that point there would only be one officer on the floor of the cell house. On May 2nd, at around 1.40 p.m., Coy made his move. He and Marvin Hubbard overpowered the one guard and let their four accomplices out of their cells. Coy then covered his body in grease, climbed the gun gallery, spread the bars, and squirmed inside. He surprised the gallery officer and overpowered him as well. Coy grabbed a 45, a rifle, and every key he could find. Unfortunately for him, the one key he desperately needed that could have opened the cell block wasn't among them. The escapees tried every key, but none would open the door to freedom. The locks were designed so that if an improper key was used in the lock, the lock would become dysfunctional. So by using repeatedly wrong keys, they eventually destroyed the lock, so there was no way they were gonna get that door open. Meanwhile, Joe Kretzer, a former public enemy number five, along with other SKPs, were taking officers hostage as the guards rushed in to investigate the disturbance. Officer Logason and eight others were locked in the two cells at the end of Block C. Officers tried unsuccessfully for hours to free the hostages, hurling tear gas and exchanging gunfire with the rioters. While the drama unfolded inside Alcatraz, a fascinated public and media kept constant vigil. By now, Kretzer and Coy had exhausted all their possibilities for getting the cell house door open. They were overheard saying, we're going out the hard way. 
A frustrated Kretzer began shooting the hostages in the cells and leaving the officers to die. One of the other escapees, Sam Shockley, realized Officer Loggison had not been hit and implored Kretzer to shoot them all, they'll testify against us. But Kretzer was reluctant to kill Officer Loggison. They were friends. They were friends. And Kretzer said, well, that's Mr. Loggis, and he's a friend of mine. Shockley insisted that Kretzer should finish the job. So Kretzer raised the gun and set it on the bars and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Loggison. And he pulled the trigger and the gun was empty. It just clicked. So he put in a new clip and fired. And he missed him. I mean, he's barely creased his cheek from a distance of four feet. I don't know whether he was trying to shoot him or not. Loggison then played dead on the cell floor until the hostages were freed by a rescue team eight hours later. The Battle of Alcatraz raged for two days. Finally, Marines dropped powerful concussion grenades into the cell house. Three of the escapees retreated to their cells, but Coy, Kretzer, and Hubbard hid in a utility corridor to make their last stand. Eventually, Officers sprayed the corridor with bullets, killing all of them. In the end, two officers had been killed and 14 wounded. Of the three remaining escapees, two were executed in the gas chamber. The third was spared because he was just 19 years old. After this fearsome episode, no one dared an escape attempt from Alcatraz for another 10 years. Alcatraz was a surprisingly small prison. Its inmate population averaged only about 260 men. The typical maximum security penitentiary holds more than 1,500. Throughout its history, 1,545 men had the dubious honor of doing time at the federal penitentiary. Many famous names were admitted to Alcatraz, but the prison usually did its job of reducing each of them to just another number. I give you a picture of my mugshot. You can take a look on that mugshot. You will not see my name on that nameplate. You'll see a number. You could take a look on any other mugshot and you'll see the name on there with it. But this is the only prison that I've ever been in where my name was a number. Number 85 was the legendary crime czar, Al Capone. Allegedly, Capone had managed to run his operations from other prisons, but things changed when he got to Alcatraz. At Alcatraz, he apparently tried to uh, maneuver his way around the warden, but was completely prohibitive from doing so, and he became the cell house sweep. To my mind, one of the worst jobs, because you don't, you hardly leave the cell house. When Capone arrived in 1934, his advancing syphilis had begun to destroy his mental capacities. By 1939, overcome by the disease, he was transferred out. Number 117 was George Machine Gun Kelly, who was part of the first shipment from Leavenworth. He was college educated and from a wealthy Memphis family. He began as a bootlegger in the 1920s, but moved on to bank robbery to impress his girlfriend and future wife, Kate Shannon. In 1933, the couple was convicted for kidnapping millionaire Charles Urschel. But Kelly would become a changed man at Alcatraz. Kelly was probably our, our best inmate we had here, er, probably ever, on Alcatraz. He reminded me more of a bank president than a bank robber. The way he acted, the way he talked, even the way he dressed in his prison garb. He worked here in the laundry area. He was a clerk, so he was able to get his clothing real press and everything. And he was just a, a, just a real nice guy. It's amazing, you know, from his reputation. You think he's a terrible man, but actually he was probably one of our best ones. Very nice guy, as far as I was concerned. I think if you go back and research Kelly's wife, you'll find out that 
His wife, Catherine, was a motivating force behind all the things that Kelly did. Uh, she apparently was a very beautiful girl. Carol, Kelly was madly in love with her, and she wanted him to rob these banks so she could have the nice things. And he was stupid enough to do it. Number 325 was Alvin Creepy Carpus, the FBI's first public enemy number one. He was convicted of shooting a policeman and kidnapping the brewery millionaire, William Hamm. Carpus spent 26 years on Alcatraz, longer than any other inmate. Unlike Machine Gun Kelly, he was hated by the staff and the other prisoners. Carpus was creepy. I worked with him in the bakery for about three years. On a couple occasions, had problems with him. Uh, Carpus with a gun may have been um, potentially very dangerous. As an individual, man to man, he wasn't. Another notorious inmate was number 594, Robert Stroud, better known as the Birdman of Alcatraz. Stroud's public perception is filled with myth. The Birdman never actually kept birds at Alcatraz. At Leavenworth Penitentiary, he had created a bird menagerie, conducted research, and had written books. But once transferred to Alcatraz in 1942, he was never again allowed to keep birds. In reality, Stroud was far from the kindly old gentleman portrayed by Burt Lancaster in the Hollywood movie. He was highly intelligent, but he was also a dangerous sociopath and double murderer. He was kept in solitary confinement for 43 years because of his crimes and his violent behavior in prison. From my point of view, he was a manipulator. He was a conniver. He liked chaos. He liked turmoil. Um, yet he was, uh, physically, he was a coward as far as I was concerned. Stroud continually instigated fights and riots, so he was transferred to a special cell created just for him in the prison hospital. He would spend his remaining 11 years at Alcatraz in these quarters, totally isolated from other prisoners. Morton Sobel was one of the few inmates sentenced directly to Alcatraz. In 1951, he was convicted of espionage along with Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. The Rosenbergs were sent to Sing Sing's electric chair for selling atomic bomb secrets to the Russians. So Bell was given 30 years at the Rock. Of course, the reason I'm here today is because at the trial, the government did not connect me up with the atom bomb. And that, that was the difference between the death penalty and the 30 years that I got. So Bell wasn't the typical hardcore convict at Alcatraz, but he developed a unique camaraderie with the other inmates. Generally, my reception by the other men was quite warm for two reasons. One, they, mine was a whole pro, high profile case. And they knew from their experience that the FBI had put pressure on me. And I had resisted the FBI pressure. The other thing, your rating is determined also by your sentence. Since I had 30 years, that raised my rating. The extent of the bond between men on Alcatraz became most evident for Sobel when his friends, the Rosenbergs, died in the electric chair. When Julius and Ethel executed, the first one that told me about it was a guard. And he told it to me in a way, not of a guard talking to an inmate, but person to person. And then the next morning, when I got up, the inmates had all learned about it. The men came over and told me how sorry they were that my rap partners had been executed. And their concern was really heartfelt. These were people who were supposed to be hardened criminals. But in this respect, that hardness disappeared, and they were just one concerned person talking to another and it, it affected me deeply to find them all so moved by such an event. 
Maintaining a prison on Alcatraz Island was complicated and expensive. To house an inmate cost roughly $14 a day compared to the federal average of $5.40. There was no water on the island, so it had to be shipped in by barge and stored in tanks. Electricity was supplied by an antiquated DC power plant built in the early 1900s. By the early 1960s, the prison was decaying badly and the cost to rebuild it would have been exorbitant. The Bureau of Prisons was already thinking of closing the infamous facility when a highly publicized escape brought attention to the deteriorating conditions on the rock. On July 11, 1962, Frank Morris and two brothers, John Anglin and Clarence Anglin, staged a remarkably ingenious breakout. Their attempt inspired the Clint Eastwood movie, Escape from Alcatraz. The men realized the walls that held them were deteriorating, so they set out to enlarge the vents in the backs of their cells. They dug for nine months with an impressive array of homemade tools. Some were created from spoons stolen in the mess hall. They even managed to create an electric drill from a vacuum cleaner motor. As their digging progressed, they disguised the work with fake vents built from notebook cardboard and paper mache. They built paddles for moving through the water, a bar spreader and a wrench, and a periscope to see around corners. Referencing an article they found in Popular Mechanics magazine, they fashioned life preservers from rubber raincoats. For the finishing touch, they sculpted fake heads, which they placed in their beds so the guards would think they were asleep in their cells. Each man built a dummy head that, well, wasn't exactly high art, but it worked in a dark cell in the middle of the night. And uh, the heads were constructed out of uh, weird combinations of soap and concrete bits and plaster of Paris and hair that was uh, picked up off the barbershop floor. At around 9 p.m. on June 11th, the men placed their fake heads on their pillows and crawled out of their cells. They then climbed the utility corridor and broke out to the roof through an air shaft. I knew they were going out that night. We could hear them going up through the tunnel in between the cells. And when they hit that roof, hundreds of seagulls took off raising hell. I mean, they raised hell. And I thought, I told my buddy, I said, hey, Lou, I said, oh, man, they're busted now. Them seagulls raising hell. But nobody investigated. They were able to cross the roof of the cell house, went down a, a stove pipe, came out down to the shower room entrance, went over one set of uh, barbed wire, got down to the water, went over another set of barbed wire, and uh, went into the water on the east side of the island facing Berkeley probably sometime between 9 and 10 p.m. at night and 7 o'clock the next morning. When head count came, quite literally, um, uh, three inmates didn't get out of bed. A giant manhunt was launched. Several days later, some of their equipment and a plastic bag containing a money order in Anglin's name washed up on shore. But the three men were never found. Today, all three are listed as drowned and presumed dead, but officially, the case remains open. I'd like to sit here and tell you that Morris, John, and Clarence, and them guys, they made it, but they didn't. I know in my heart they didn't. Uh, their bones is probably still out in that bay somewhere. In 1963, Attorney General Robert Kennedy finally ordered the closure of Alcatraz Penitentiary and the last of the prisoners left the island on March 21st of that year. In November of 1969, Native Americans from several different tribes claimed the island as Indian land, 
citing a little-known treaty that allowed them to take over any abandoned federal territory. The Indians planned to convert the island into a Native American educational and cultural complex. However, vandalism and arson marred the efforts. During the occupation, five buildings were gutted by fire, including the warden's house and the lighthouse. After 18 months of occupation, the remaining Indians were removed from the island by federal marshals. In 1972, Alcatraz became part of the national park system. Today, it hosts more than a million tourists every year. As visitors tour the prison, they gain a sense of life on the rock. But can one ever truly appreciate what the inmates endured? Jim Quillen left Alcatraz in 1952, a reformed man. He went on to raise a family and enjoy a successful career as an X-ray technician. But the memory of Alcatraz never faded. I would have never, never, never have let the law bring me back to prison. What Alcatraz did to me was, it made me hard in some aspects that uh, I could never face a future of this again. And I wouldn't do it. I would die before I'd do it. Whitey Thompson spent 24 years in jail and five years on Alcatraz. Since his release, he has lectured to young people, warning them of the horrible realities of prison life. Thompson has been offered pardons for his past crimes, but he has always declined. I stopped and thought about all the people that worked in them banks when I went in there ramming that sword off shotgun into them, double barrel shotgun. How did it affect them people all these years later on down the road? I interrupted their lives and I had no right to do this. So who am I today to accept a pardon when they never got a pardon? That's the only thing that bothers me today. I'm 74 years old is I, I think people that I hurt. I interrupted their lives. I had no right to do that. So how can I accept the pardon? How can I be honest with myself? except one when they never got that.